after Jesus washed his disciples' feet the night that he was betrayed, the Apostle John recorded these words from Jesus spoken to the group of men who would eventually turn the world upside down. Jesus said to these men, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, Jesus said, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And with these words, Jesus set in motion his vision, his agenda, his idea, his dream for how his followers would learn to relate to each other. And by following that vision that Jesus laid out for his followers, how those followers would be able to impact those in the world who weren't yet following him. By this, the world will know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. I believe it is absolutely impossible, 2,000 years later, to properly capture the weight, the, the significance of these words spoken by Jesus in that moment. This simple, direct, straightforward, no loopholes command to love one another became the secret sauce for the explosive growth of the early church those who would eventually become known as followers of the way, the way of Jesus, right? They lived differently. They lived differently from the culture around them. You see, in a culture filled with hostility, cruelty, violence, deception, betrayal, and chaos, Jesus' followers lived differently. They practiced love, which led them to live a life of peace, and patience, and kindness, and gentleness, goodness, and self-control toward others. They truly were counterculture. The, the, the early followers of the way, they refused revenge. They chose the path of servanthood. They lifted each other up. They cared for one another when they suffered. They collected and distributed financially to help those who had significant needs. And they did so much more than that. And as they did it, they had an impact on the world that was watching them. They had an impact on outsiders who wondered what made them different. This, this thing called the way, the, those who were practicing the way of Jesus, they began to watch and observe and think, I want to know more. I, I want to understand why they do what they do. And, and, and that led many more to become followers of Jesus, just like those in the early church. Fast forward 2,000 years. Let's be honest. 2,000 years later, followers of the way, we, we, we know it as the church, right? We don't refer to the movement of Jesus' followers as the way, but that's what they were known as in those early days. We're, we're the church, big C church, right? All those who are following Jesus. But let's be honest. Many who would be considered followers of the way have forgotten the ways of Jesus, they, they have forgotten the, the promise of Jesus' words to his followers. They've forgotten the simple command to love one another. See, many have traded the call to love for a call to fight, to take up arms. As a call, instead of laying down your rights, but to fight for their rights, to, to have their own agenda, to, to embrace their own ideologies, to... to 
elevate their own theological bent over the simple ways of Jesus. And here's what's happened 2,000 years ago, or 2,000 years later. Because there have been enough of us, followers of Jesus, who have actually abandoned the ways of Jesus, the world has taken notice and have decided, no thanks. Jesus is not for me. And it's because of what they often see in those who are following him. Today, we start our fall ministry season. And this fall, for the next 12 weeks, next three months, we're going to look at what most people would refer to in, in Scripture as the one another commands. That's why we're calling the series One Another, right? Simple, right? Super creative. But what we're going to do over the next 12 weeks is we're going to, to look at uh, about a dozen different one another commands. There's actually 59 different occurrences in the New Testament where one of the, the New Testament writers would use the phrase one another, or like we see this morning, Jesus talking about one another. We're not going to look at all of them, but all of them, what we need to establish this morning as we start this series, all of them can be rooted back to, can be tied back to Jesus' words to his disciples on the night in which he was betrayed when he said, you are to love one another. And that is how the world will know that you are my disciple. It's what love looks like. We're going to go back and wrestle, or go, go, and go back to the scriptures and wrestle with some of these one another commands. We're going to look at some of the reasons why some of these commands are difficult to, to put into practice. We're, we're going to imagine what it might look like if we actually began to practice each of these individual commands. And we're going to find some practical ways to actually do the one another's together as a body of believers. And here's where I want to just kind of press pause and, and say this. Um, I've been your pastor for over 25 years now. And I can tell you that most of you, most, I, 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 again, I'm sure there are some exceptions because <laughs> we're all human. But, but over the years, most of us have learned to love. Well, we don't love perfectly, but I think we've learned to love well. We, we, we're, we've learned and we're learning to love God well, to, to love each other well, to love our neighbors well. And so we're, we're already starting, I think, ahead of the curve in, in many ways. And so the way I described followers of Jesus just a little bit, little bit ago doesn't necessarily describe us. It doesn't describe you. And I'm, I'm glad for that. So over these next few months, some of what we talk about might feel a little bit like review. Like, hey, we've been here before. But review is good, right? School teachers, reviewing is good, right? Students, you got to review. Yeah, got to go back over things sometimes to just kind of nail it down deep, to drive it down a little bit deeper. We're going we're gonna to review a little bit. But I, I hope that even as we visit some familiar scriptures, some familiar commands, that it will be fresh to us because we're, we're taking the time to slow down and examine our own hearts and, and kind of wrestle with, okay, how, how am I living this out? How, how am I putting them into practice? You know, one of my favorite quotes about the church connected to, to the one and others that we're going to use uh, a lot over the this, this next few months. And you'll probably get sick of me saying it, but that's okay. That's okay. Uh, it's from Andy Stanley. Stanley and he, he said this one time. He said that a primary activity of the early church was one anothering one another. And when you think about it, it's true. That as a body of believers comes together and they begin to function under a specific name, they gather in a specific location, they meet at a specific time, a lot of what we do is we practice one anothering one another, right? That, that, that was not the only thing that the early church did, but it was a primary activity. 
And so immediately when we, meet about, when we think about this moment in time, Sunday morning, you're all sitting in a row looking up at me. Can I tell you something and be honest with you as a pastor? I love having you sitting in rows. I love that you're here. But one of the difficult things to do when you're sitting in a row on a Sunday morning is to one another one another. There's very little one anothering that can happen between 10.30 and 11.40-ish, eh, 45-ish on a Sunday morning when we're sitting in a row. And, and that's why over this, this next season, right, in order for us to live out the one another commands, some of you are going to have to make some decisions. Some of you are going to have to make decisions to move beyond a Sunday morning experience with us as a church family. To, to move beyond, hey, I really like the music and the, the guy that talks, you know, is not horrible. I can at least, you know, track with what he has to say. And, and you're going to have to say, okay, I, I need to move beyond that kind of an experience with this group of believers. And if not with this group of believers, then I want to encourage you to find a group of believers that you can one another, one another with. Right? Because it's impossible to obey most of the New Testament without being in relationship with a group of believers because most of the instructions that are given directly to churches have some kind of a connection with how we interact with, how we treat, how we respond to, how we live in community with other followers of Jesus. It's that important. So my prayer couple of things for this, this series, for this fall, is that number one, many of you would step out of a mere Sunday morning connection with us as a church family. It's one of the reasons why we put this next step card in front of you. See, again, I, I think that for some that have been coming on Sunday mornings, or, or maybe this is your first time here, great, I'm glad you're here. I want to tell you something. We want you to experience more than a Sunday morning moment. We really do. We want to help you grow in your faith, and that requires some steps, right? So for some of you, I, want to, I really want to encourage you to take some next steps, which might be, again, beginning to follow Jesus, taking a step of being baptized, getting into some type of a community, whether it's in a life group or a discipleship group, engaging in a ministry team. This isn't a membership, covenant membership drive, but that might be a step that some of you might need and are ready to take as well. But I want you to, to take a step beyond a Sunday morning seat. All right? that's, that's our prayer, our desire. Then there's another group of you who have done that. I mean, you are fully in. You're engaged. I look into your faces, and I know that this is your church. This is home. This is where you give. This is where you serve. This is where you do life with other believers. My prayer for you is that you would invite others into your circle, that, that you would invite others. If you're on a ministry team, that you would say, I'm going to invite somebody else to join me on my ministry team. If you're in a D group, hey, I'm going to invite some other people to join me in my D group my discipleship group. If you're in a life group, hey, we're, we're going to open up the doors wide and invite some more people to be part of, of our life group. And, and it might just simply be, I'm going to invite somebody over for coffee. I'm going to have dinner with somebody that I don't know. I'm going to do something to demonstrate that I really want to live out the one and others with a group of people here at Zion. Again, it may look different for all, for all of us, but all of us can take some steps this season. So, that's a little, bit of a, a little bit of an introduction for you about where, where we're going and, and why we're going there. So w- one of the things that as a pastor, when I preach, when I teach, is that I always try to think about is I think about the resistance. Like wh- why would people resist what God's word teaches? And so I, I try to apply that in, in this, this season. And, and, and I, I, it's not an exhaustive list, but when I think about why there's resistance, I won't say rebellion, Right? That's maybe too harsh, but resistance, a hesitancy to practicing the one and others. What, what are some of the reasons why? And I, I've got three. You could probably add to it, but here's three reasons why I think this is hard for us. Number one is the idea of cultural individualism. We, we live in a culture that, that praises, that celebrates independence, right? This is how America was built, rugged independence. I can do it myself. I don't need anybody else. It's, it's built into our DNA. 
We're taught from an early age what it looks like to be self-sufficient. We're taught how to handle problems on our own. And, and there's, a, there's a sense that that is good and right and honorable, but taken to the extreme, it leads to isolation and loneliness. And I'm afraid that as a culture, that's where we have stepped into. We live in a culture of lonely, isolated people. And some of it uh, is born out of um, maybe past hurt with people. And if that's you, listen, I, I'm sorry that maybe you have been hurt by people and it has caused you to kind of retreat, right? I get it, and I would, I would love to walk with you slowly through that, but I don't think that the answer to past pain relationally with people is to run away from it for the rest of your life. It's just not, it's not the answer. When we embrace an over-the-top sense of self and individualism, we lose out on the connection that God intends for us to have, the support, the strength that comes from one anothering one another. There's another reason why I think some of us are resistant, and that's this, the fear of vulnerability. The fear of vulnerability. Let's face it. Letting people into our lives can be scary because we know ourselves, right? Uh, There's parts of me that I don't want you to know about me, and there's parts of you that I'm sure you don't want me to know about you. And so when we talk about one anothering, we're already kind of, you know, moving two or three steps ahead and trying to know where you're headed. You're, you're going to talk about, like, kind of, kind of getting deep with each other, being in deep relationship with each other. And I'm just not into that. And, and, and part of the reason is we don't want to show our true selves. We, we don't want to be real. We don't want to be vulnerable. We worry that if people really knew us, the real us, taken off the mask, that they may judge us or reject us or even worse, they, might not just, they just might not like us if they really knew us. But again, here's the key. Vulnerability is necessary to one another, one another. And when we, are allow, when we, are, we allow ourselves to be known, flaws and all, we open the door to genuine, biblical community. Let me give you one more. Busyness and priorities. Hello. I I feel like this is something that we kind of come back to again and again and again. Why? Because I think it's something that we need to come back to again and again and again. Our culture has changed. The pace of life for most of us is different than it was for our parents, our grandparents. It's different than maybe than it was for us even 10 or 15 years ago. Life has gotten much more uh, fast-paced, much more complicated. We have so much stuff going on, and this is not a, you know, shake your fist. It's just a reality. But the ripple to that reality is it has caused many people to find ways to discard, discount, you know, disassociate with this idea of connection with other believers. We just don't have time for it. Or when we, when we hear a pastor or a church talking about making a commitment to relationships, you interpret it as, that's just one more thing I got to do. And I don't have time to do all the things that I'm already doing. Now you're saying I need to be in community. Now you're saying that I need to join a group. Now you're saying I got to take some time to serve. Now you're saying that I've got to prioritize this group of people. <sighs> and, and, and I get it. I get it. But I'm going to push you through that. If I could, how about nudge? I want to nudge you past that because it's on the other side of, of prioritizing community, prioritizing one another in one another that you will find that it, there is value in it, that it is worth it, that it's worth adjusting and sacrificing and, and, and rearranging some things so that you can experience what God designed the church to be, a community that truly loves one another. Now, you can probably add some of your own reasons why you might be resistant to what we're going to focus on this fall, and that's fine. You can do that. As a matter of fact, I encourage you to do that. Be honest. You might be like, I've got five other reasons why. Be honest. But be honest with God and say, God, help me. 
Help me to push through this, whatever my resistance is. And just imagine being a part of a church that takes Jesus' words and his vision for his movement seriously and, and begin one anothering one another. This morning, I, I, I want to, just with the time that we have left, I want us to, to share one of the one another's that really isn't a command as much as it is a statement of reality. It, it, it just is. Whether we think it is or not, it is. Whether we live it out or not, it is. Whether we believe it or not, it is. It's just true. And it's found in the book of Romans, if you want to take your Bible and, and turn to Romans chapter 12. This is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church in Rome. And as he's kind of gotten the back, back half of the, the letter, he starts to get really practical. The first two-thirds are super theological. The last third is very practical. And we're kind of in the practical section of his letter. And, and Paul writes these words to, to these believers who were living in, in Rome. He says this. He says, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually, and here's the one another, members of one another, or members one of another. And, and, right, and right away, here's what I, I, I want us to do. Let's, let's just park on, on the word members. All right? Th- this is not him doing a church membership drive. And I know that when we talk about church membership at Zion, I've lived in western Pennsylvania for long enough to know that church membership has all kinds of connotations depending on your faith background, depending on the denomination that you are part of, depending on the kind of experiences you've had with churches of different denominations. So Paul is not talking about church membership here, right? He's also not talking about members like we talk about membership. How many of you are members of something? YMCA, anybody members of the YMCA? Costco membership, Sam's Club membership, right? The, the word members and being, and, and being a member of something, like we, we, like that's not an uncommon idea. But here's the thing. If, if, we, if we think Paul is talking about members like we think about the YMCA or our Costco membership, it, it, we, we're thinking incorrectly about being members of one another. Be, being a member of a Y simply means I've paid my money and I can utilize the Y however I want. Take it or leave it. I've paid my money. If I want to go in and work out, I can. If I don't want to work out, I won't. Uh, they've got some membership benefits for me. You know, I can go to a luncheon or I can take this class. I can pay a little bit extra money for that class, but that's another story. Um, but there's, sorry, Michelle. <laughs> we love the Y. Just a little needle, that's all. <laughs> I go there every day, well, three or four days a week. Anyway, um, or Costco, right? I pay my, my money. I go and I get some discounts. I get some bulk, you know, some bulk items. It's a good deal, right? But it's, it, there's, there's, no, there's no responsibility to Costco other than to pay my money. There's no responsibility to the why other than to pay my money and to make sure you wipe off the machines when you're done, right? But, but it's just different, Right? That when we think about members and being a member of something, we tend to think, what's in it for me? I'm a member here. My rights and privileges of membership. Paul is not wanting us to think about membership in that way. What, what's Paul doing in this? Well, Paul is using a metaphor. Not a YMCA or Costco metaphor, but the metaphor of a body. When he talks about we are members of, one of another. He's talking about the parts of a body. And he does that to help us understand how a church functions. And more specifically, how we are to think about the connection that we have with each other. Again, such a simple but brilliant and powerful and effective metaphor to describe the church. I mean, think about your own body. 
it has different parts, right? Hands and feet and eyes and ears. And each part of the body matters. Each part of your body has a specific job. Your hands don't do what your feet do. Your eyes don't do what your ears do. They're all different, but they're all important. And they all work together so that your body can function properly. Simple, beautiful, powerful metaphor that Paul uses here. He uses it again in 1 Corinthians 12 in a a much longer uh, form. But here in Romans 12, he's using that same metaphor. He's saying that as followers of Jesus, we, we are like parts of a single body. All of us are different. We have different personalities, different experiences, different perspectives, different skill sets, right? Different strengths, different weaknesses. But we're all meant to work together, to support each other, to be connected in a way that is meaningful, that is life-giving, that makes a difference in our world. That's how we're supposed to function together as a body. Again, if we just think about it, imagine trying to walk if your feet decided that they didn't want to be part of your body anymore. Your feet are just, they're gone. Goodbye. Imagine if your eyes decided, I don't want to see anymore. The rest of your body would suffer because it's all interconnected. And listen, the same is true for us. If you consider Zion the body that you are part of. And I'm not talking about membership here. I'm just saying, this is, this is where I'm at. This is the body that I consider myself to be a part of. When you don't function according to how God has gifted you, how he's wired you, how, the experiences and skill sets that you bring with you every single time that we gather, then we miss out. We, we miss out. I need you and you need me. We aren't whole as a body if you consider yourself part of the body but don't live as though you are a member connected to this body of believers. All right? It's just true. It's just true. We are members of one another. And again, think about it. Paul was writing to a local body He was writing to a group of followers of Jesus who were meeting in a specific time and place. They understood that Paul was directing his words to them, the church in Corinth. Not the church in Galatia, not the church in Colossae, not the church in Ephesus, not the church in Philippi, but to them, this local body. They were reading it. They understood that Paul wasn't talking about this this kind of big picture. Oh, yes, we're all members of the body of Christ. That is true. We all are all part of the big C church. I am a member with believers in China and Africa and India, South America. We are members with those who attend First Baptist Church and those who attend Trinity Point. But can I tell you something that I can't do with them? I can't one another them very well because I'm not in relationship with them. I'm not connected to them. I'm not around them. You know who I can learn to and measure my life against when it comes to the one another's of Scripture? You. And you can do the same with me and with each other. See, when we we read this passage, we ought to read, read it differently. When we read Paul's words, for as in one body we have many members, we can make it personal. See, we we can very honestly and very truly say, for as in Zion Church, we have Spencer and Chelsea, we have Alicia, we have Melissa, we have Josh and Angelo, We have Chris and Michelle. We have Kim and Marcus and Missy. And we have Tom and Kayla. And we have Sandy. We're all individual parts of this body of believers. Simply called Zion. It's just a name. We happen to meet in this space. But our connection goes so much deeper than that. 
We are all together members of one body, the body of Jesus Christ. And that should mean something to all of us. Paul goes on to talk about the idea that that all of us are still, though we're connected, we are different. Verse 6, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. We're all different. Paul would want us to understand that our diversity is needed. Our diversity inside of this body is needed, just like diversity is needed in your physical body. If, you, if your whole body were feet, or if your whole body were legs, or if your whole body were hands, you, first of all, you'd be a freak, right? You'd be like, what was that? But it, it, couldn't, it couldn't function. We need the different parts of our body to function. We need diversity in the church in order to function. But we've got to function together. We must stay united Why? Because we are members of one another. I said it before and I'll say it again. I belong to you and you belong to me. We belong to each other. And that ought to cut against the spirit of independence that many of us bring to every piece and every part of our life. The truth is we're not independent. We are interdependent. I need you. And you need me. We need the body. Paul tells us how to live this out. Again in verse 6, he says, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, he says, let us use them. Because we're members together, we're different together, we should use our differences together. Let us use them. Then he goes on and he starts to list some ways that the the body of Christ is gifted. He says, if it's prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts, encourages in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. And, And again, this is not an exhaustive list of all the different ways that a body of Christ functions, but it's just a little snapshot. Paul Paul would say, like, however you're wired, however you're bent, however you're gifted, use your gift. And, And again, when we talk about Zion as a church family, we're talking about a church that a lot of people use their gifts regularly to make ministry happen, to make what we do when we turn the lights on possible. And I'm grateful for it. But as we continue to see God bringing in new friends and new families and new faces, and and he is, and we're grateful for every new face that walks through our door, and we want to have our arms wide open to every new face that comes through. What that also does is it brings a greater need for ministry. I was talking with Pam the other day, and we're getting ready to open another preschool room uh, at the end of this month. Why? Because you all keep having babies, and that's a beautiful thing. That's a good thing. Right, but our preschool department right now, um, in our preschool and elementary, during the, the, the course of a month, our, our baby nursery and then our, I forget how, they're, the, the next step up, and then we open the new room, and then our barn room for our preschoolers. And then if we add in our, our elementary uh, team, our elementary um, department, Kids Life, I, I, just, I was just curious. I said, how many volunteers do we need a month to serve in preschool and elementary ministry? That number, because we ask people to serve once a month, that number is like 65. That's, that's almost, that's, well, that's about over, that's over half of, of the adults at Zion are needed just to keep the rooms open every month in our preschool and children's department. And some might say, well, that's a lot. I think it's glorious. I think that's great because it's a sign of life. It's a sign of, of health, Right? But it's just something that we have to say, look, we, we, we have these needs. We have these things going on. You know, we want to continue in our tech department to have teams of people back there that are, that are leading in our, te- in our tech department. We want space and making room for more artists. We want more people to, to welcome and greet. Our food distribution ministry, we had a, a half a dozen or more, uh, closer to a dozen, I guess, we had them all up. Uh, folks here yesterday 
uh, unpacking a, a truck from Erie for our food distribution ministry. And then we'll have tons of volunteers through the month who will hand out food to folks. I, and I'm, I'm just scratching the surface. But, but this body needs everyone doing their part. Why? Because we are members of one another. For us to fulfill the vision that Jesus has given to us, we need everyone to do their part. We are members of one another. So, how do we begin to to live this reality out? This is not a command. The command is what, what Paul says after that. Let us use them. The command is to use your giftedness. The reality is we are members of one another, all right? So how do, how, what's something practical, what's something tangible that we can do? Well, if it's true that we are members of one another, here's one thing that we can do. Stay connected. Stay connected. All right? This is the pastoral plug for church attendance, right? Yeah, pastor just wants us in church. Yes, I do. I don't want you in church for me. I want you in church for you. And I want you in church for the person sitting next to you and the person behind you, and the person and persons that you haven't even met yet. I I want you to prioritize our gathering times because we only get to do it 52 times a year. And every time that you are not here for whatever reason, and there's reasons, I get it. This is not, not whatever. It's just a reality. Like, stay connected to the body. We need you, and you need the body. It's something that you can do as a member of this body, if you consider Zion your, 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 your body. The, the next thing is to discover your why. Discover your why. If you don't know how to use your giftedness, if you don't know how to, how to engage in a church family, I want to help you. I don't know if we have that slide up there, the discover your why slide. I didn't put it in the loop here. But if we can throw that up there. Look, I, I, I am passionate about helping people discover their passion, their pain, their proficiencies, and how God puts all those things together to, f- to, to determine what God may want them to do in life. Discovering your why um, is something that I would love to do, and, and we'll help you with that. If you just take a picture of the, of the QR code, it'll take you to a, an online assessment, simple assessment that we've created that can help you begin to flesh out your why. Do we, do we, we just lost it. Can we leave that up there for just a second in case anyone want to take a picture? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, so if you want to take a picture of that, we want to, I, I would love to sit down and talk to you about discovering your why. And then, again, the last thing is, is this, move out of a row and find a circle. Move out of a row and find a circle. Find a circle somewhere. A ministry team where you can kind of look at each other and say, hey, let's serve together. A D group, a life group. Find some connection where you can look at people eyeball to eyeball, not back of heads. You got to move out of the rows to do that. All right? So I, I've been wrestling with this message quite a bit this week. And, and, and the ending of this message um, still was like dot, dot, dot. I, I didn't know exactly how to wrap this up. And and here's, here's where I, f- I feel like I, 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 we need to, to be. Because we're practicing the one another's, we're going to one another one another. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let us one another one another just for a couple of minutes before we take communion. You're like, oh no, what, what's he about to do? Jacob and I think Isaac and maybe one more person, I'm not sure who, they're going to grab a microphone. And I just want, I want us to be able to speak to each other in a positive, affirming way about this particular body. Zion is not perfect. If you're new or newish to Zion, look, we're not a perfect church. They let me be the pastor. We definitely are not a perfect church, right? We're learning how to be followers of Jesus who are passionate about one another, passionate about discipleship, passionate about living out on mission. There there are some things that we have been learning over the years, But here's the question I want you guys to answer. Not everybody, so don't feel obligated. We're not passing the mic. But I'd love for a few people to answer this question. It's simply this. What does it mean to you to be a member of this body of Jesus' followers? Now, again, when I say member, I'm not talking about church membership. You're like, well, I'm not a member of the church. But as part of this body, what does it mean to you? This is not a 
three-minute testimony. This is a three-sentence testimony, four-sentence testimony. But what does it mean to you to be a member of this body of believers? And we're going to take a few minutes to do that while we're setting up communion. Somebody, what does it mean to you to be a member of this particular group of people? And I didn't set anybody up, so I don't have any plants. Hello. I don't, I don't like awkward silence, so that's why I'm going first. But um, I think the church, what the church means to me is it just makes me a better person. Like my faith has grown tremendously over the last decade that I've gone here. And I know if we're going through something, I know the church has our back and um, we have the church's back. So and I think that was about four sentences. So here we go. Here you go. Thanks. Somebody else. Just a few more. I, I just, what does it mean to you to be a member of this body? I love that we are learning. I love that we are taught and we are learning new things each time we walk through the doors. It's okay. so important. Okay. Somebody else? Does Zelda want to say something? What does Zelda want to say? Um, so, church is all about just learning about God and learning how to get better to know God and Jesus. And church is what we need. Church helps us um, know how to treat others and ourselves and it just helps us learn how to just treat everyone in this world. I like it. Well said, Zelda. Well said. A couple more. What does it mean to be a part of this group of people? I have a home. Okay, means you have a home. Okay. Somebody else? I'm relatively new here, um, but it means that you all have embraced my kids, and I don't have to worry um, when my kid is running around out there and being crazy. You all just say, hey, that's Niklaus, and I love that. And we, and we love him. Fifteen years, I think we've been here, and um, what this body means to both of us, I, I think I'm going to speak for you, um, <laughs> is that uh, we don't have to do life alone. Um, we always have people that we can count on. Um, I don't think that we ever go a week without, you know, texting somebody in the body, um, whether it's just asking how their day's going or if we're having a bad day, hey, can you pray for us? Um, we, we know that we always have people that we can count on. You know, I know that uh, guys in my D group, um, if I need something, I know that I can count on them to uh, be of assistance to whatever I need. Um, and it's just really nice to have that, um, that feeling of security to know that, like, when stuff gets real, there are guys that have your back. A couple more. Anybody else? Nobody? One body? Two body? Nobody. All right. Great. Thank you for, for sharing. And that was completely un, unscripted and unplanted, so thank you for, for sharing. But again, I, I, I do, um, do want to express to you guys how grateful I am for this body that is learning and growing. And uh, God, may we continue to practice one anothering one another. And if you're new or newish to Zion and we can help you take some steps toward making it easier 
to one another, one another, let us know, and we want to help you to do that. The worship team is going to come, and, and, and regularly we spend time together around this table, uh, the Lord's table, communion. Depending on your experience, you may do it differently, um, but whenever we do it, and we do it often, um, we try not to just let it be routine and rote. And this week in my, my D group, um, we were talking about, um, talking about the passage where Paul talks about, about communion. And uh, so some of you are like, oh, that D group's a little bit behind. Maybe a little bit. That's okay. Um, we're studying through the New Testament together as, as D groups, so um, not quite finished yet. Um, and, and we talked about this, and, and this, was, this is where I want us to think today. When we take communion, what is the emotion that we feel in this moment when we receive communion? And as we talked about it, I think one of the honest statements that somebody made, me, um, and others, all the other guys that echoed it, is far too often we don't feel any emotion. And that's not, that's not a good thing, right? It, it, it just, we just do it. Um, Th- this moment for us can carry a lot of different emotion depending on who we are and where we're at in our faith journey, depending on the kind of day we've had or the week we've had. You know, for some, when we come to the table like this, the emotion might be very heavy because we know that we haven't been walking with Jesus this week. And so for some, the, the passage to examine ourselves takes on real heavy significance because we know that we've got to deal with some sin that we've allowed to creep into our life. And so the emotion when we take communion, for some, at some times, is, is, a, is a heaviness, is a, is a weight, is a sadness, because we know that we've, we've not been walking with Christ. That's okay. At times we need to feel that. For others, when you might come around the table, and, and this week maybe it's something that you heard on the radio or a song that you sang in the shower or maybe a song that we sang in worship that really just reminded you of God's grace, of his forgiveness. And when we come to this table and we reflect on Christ's body and his blood, the emotion of, of just gratitude and thankfulness over what Christ did for us, that, that's a valid emotion to feel when we take communion. Uh, again, the, 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 the emotions that we feel might vary depending upon, again, the season we're in, the week we've had, where we're at in our faith journey, and that's great. But there was a, there's an emotion that I don't think that we, um, that we think about as much as we should in this moment, and that's the emotion of joy. We don't often equate communion with joy, but I don't think it's wrong to equate the emotion of joy with this moment because of what this moment, ultimately what Christ's death means for us, right? And and specifically, it's, it's Christ's death that brings us together. It brings us together. We can be and we are members together of one body because of what Jesus did. And I hope that when you think about being members of the body of Christ, that that there's joy in that. And so today as we take communion, I want us to be joyful. And and the way that we're going to be joyful together today is when we take communion, I want us to take communion and, 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 and look at each other. You're like, well, that's weird. Well, here's, here's what we'll do. Get into some small circles. And if you're a guest with us, please look for guests. And if you're a regular, find a guest and say, hey, come join us, come join us, come join us, right? Do that. Please be mindful of that. Or if you're a college student, you guys can get in a circle together. And and when you take communion, say something like this. I'm glad to be part of the body of Christ with you. It brings me joy. And then take communion. It brings me joy to be connected because of what Christ did. And that might feel a little bit awkward, but I think it's a good stretching moment for us to remind ourselves. And you may not even know each other, and that's okay. But, but just to be able to express, like, I'm, I'm thankful that we are part of something together 
because of what Jesus did for us. If you're not a believer in Christ, this is intended and designed for Christians to reflect on his body and his blood. And if you have not yet made the decision to follow him, let me help you with that. He, he is the greatest treasure that we can ever find. And if you want to know more about following Jesus, then, then let's, let's talk about it at the end of the gathering. So let's pray. It's going to feel maybe a little bit awkward. You're going to just go ahead and take communion on your own. The circles might could be a little bit bigger, uh, and that's okay. So you can get some circles over here. D group leaders, elders, people who just kind of, you, you're, you kind of that bent that way. Gather some people around you, get them together. And then let's just, let's look into each other's eyes and be grateful um, that we are members of one body. Father, we love you and we thank you for the day. Thank you for this opportunity. And uh, we, we, we praise you for, for who you are. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I've got an idea. This, this is going to, I'm just now, as I'm looking down here, I'm just thinking about it. Cameron, come here and take, take one. You guys, are, you're going you're gonna to pick. BJ, you're going to take one. Spencer, come here and take one. You're going to gather around one of these six people. Josh, come up here and take one. Jacob, come and take one. Tom, come and take one. Matt, come and take one. These guys are going to, we're going to make it easier on everybody. They're going to just spread out, and you can gather around one of these guys. 